During my career as a physicist, I have had many conversations about special relativity. And since I started this channel, this number grew significantly. And I noticed that some of the questions and misunderstandings people have are quite common, like confusing what we see and what we know, or not understanding what is the initial configuration of the system you are describing. It's quite often the case that even a small thing you misunderstood at some point in history can prevent you to understand the full theory indefinitely, if you don't know exactly what it is. And at some point in history, I experienced these misunderstandings myself, as we all have to learn somehow. And every time I fixed one, it totally changed my perception of special relativity and physics in general. So I decided to identify the most common mistakes and misunderstandings people make in special relativity from all the conversations I had and create a list of five most common mistakes people make in special relativity and set them straight in one video. So the number one, what we see versus what we actually know. So this is a big one because it happened quite often that I had a long conversation about special relativity with someone and only very late in the discussion, when both of us were quite frustrated already, I actually realized that we don't even agree on what we are talking about. Whereas I was talking about what an observer can figure out based on the data he has. The other guy was actually talking about what an observer would see with his own eyes, given certain scenario. And this is where I'm kind of guilty myself, because sometimes in my videos I say what a certain observers see. Even though what I always mean is what an observer can figure out based on a given data. For example here. But if special relativity is correct, the observer B must have seen the observer A clock tick slower in both outgoing and ingoing part. But this is not what an observer would see with his own eyes. This is what he would figure out based on the distance, velocity and the postulates of special relativity. To give you an example that is more clear, imagine two observers having simultaneous clocks at the same position. One observer would go slowly away so that the time dilation is negligible, so that he keeps his clock synchronized to a given accuracy. So he can bring them several minutes away, for example on Mars. If this observer would look at the clock on Earth, he would see smaller time by several minutes. Yet he would claim that the clocks are synchronized the precision of several microseconds. Because knowing the distance and the speed of light, he can filter out the delay caused by the limited speed of light. This is what we mean when we say that two clocks are synchronized. In special relativity, we always talk about what an observer would figure out based on a given data and not what they see unless it's very strongly highlighted. And this has a connection with the second mistake people do. Time dilation and length contraction are just optical illusions. Well, if you approach the speed of light, the world would for sure start to look crazy, as there are many optical illusions due to the limited speed of light. These illusions, though, are almost never taught in a special relativity class as I explained in the previous mistake. The reason is that all optical effects always cancel out in an actual experiment, like twin paradox, for example. The observer B would see A clock run slower than the time dilation predicts on the outgoing journey, due to the fact that the light has to travel longer and longer distance after each tick. But this would be perfectly compensated on the ingoing journey. And all there would be left 
is a pure time dilation contribution. And also length contraction. Whenever I talk about it in my demonstration, I always show it like this, that the ship just contracts in length. But this is because I'm not talking about the optical effects. What I'm talking about is what would the observer figure out if he did the measurements and math properly. In reality, what would you actually see is quite different as you would experience the so-called teral rotation. As you can see here in this nice animation by Stigmatella, while the objects in fact do contract in length, you would see it kinda rotated due to the optical distortion and it would actually appear lengthened rather than shortened. But if you really want to know more about these optical effects, a channel called Science Click English has an excellent video about this. I strongly recommend you to watch it. Mistake number three. Understand your initial configuration. This issue was most prominent after I published one of my videos about wire and a charge experiment, where we have a wire with a non-zero current inside. Due to the current, this wire produces a magnetic field around, and the force on the particle was given purely by the magnetic part of the Lorentz force equation, since the density of the positive charges and negative charges in the wire is the same, leaving a zero net charge of the wire. Then, if you move into the rest frame of the charge, due to length contraction, the density of protons increases and the density of the electrons decreases, leaving non-zero net charge of the wire, which creates a non-zero electric force on the particle, but zero magnetic force since the velocity vanishes. By this experiment, I wanted to demonstrate that magnetic field is a purely relativistic effect of length contraction in electrodynamics and that there is only one true field in electromagnetism, which we call, for lack of the better names, electromagnetic field. But many people in the comments ask the same question. Why electrons are not already contracted since they are moving, which would create a negative charge of the wire? This would then create an opposite force to the magnetic force, possibly leaving a zero net force? Well, you are free to choose such initial configuration, but then you have to ask yourself, what is it really you want to demonstrate? I have chosen such initial configuration so that the positive and negative charge density is the same, so that we can make a clear example of what happens with electromagnetism when we change the frame of reference. In any demonstration, you have to choose a certain initial configuration and, and it's totally up to you which one you choose. The theory itself is only there to tell you how the system will evolve given such initial configuration. You may notice that whenever I demonstrate certain scenario, I always tell a specific reference frame in which this initial configuration was set. For example, here. So imagine two observers A and B in two positions, the Earth and the star that are stationary relative to each other and separated by distance of 10 light years measured in the rest frame of the observer A. Of course, if you choose unrealistic initial configuration, then your theory is likely gonna give you singularities. But did I choose unrealistic initial configuration in a wire and a charge experiment? Well, obviously not, because you certainly can have a wire that is neutral and there is a current inside. Imagine a laboratory where you have this wire without a current and the average velocity of the nearby charges is zero. There is only one frame where this is true, and it's the rest frame of the laboratory. In the wire, there is no current, and the protons and electrons 
are spaced equally. If you start the current, then electrons should contract and the wire will become charged at the start, but since the average velocity of the nearby charges is zero, the wire will attract most of the positive charges around and slowly neutralize itself relative to the laboratory. And what you are left with is a neutral wire with a current inside. So any conductive wire will always be neutral in a frame where the average velocity of nearby charges is zero. And this naturally leads us to the number four. Always keep track on which reference frame you are talking about. The classical question I got like thousand times. Two observers A and B accelerate the same way in opposite direction. Who is younger after, let's say, one day of movement? But in which frame of reference? In the frame of the observer A, B is younger. In the frame of B, A is younger. For an observer that didn't accelerate, they are the same age. In special relativity, time and space is relative and therefore, whenever you hear someone saying that that ship is 10 meters long, this distance is 10 light years or there is a 5 years on a certain clock, always keep track of which reference frame this was measured. Because when you start confusing relative quantities measured in different frame of reference, then you have a big problem in special relativity. And this leads us to the very last point. Stop confusing relative and absolute quantities. This is very crucial to have this sorted out. I know it's kinda hard to accept that time is relative because evolution didn't give us this intuition. And therefore it's natural to expect a definite answer from this example I showed you in the number 4. It must be either A or B that is truly younger, or they are the same age. This is what nature taught us, since we don't have access to the very high velocities to feel relativistic effects. But with this mindset, you won't make it very far in physics. So what is the relative quantity? Think of, for example, velocity. This is something you have intuition for. In our example from the number of four, what are the velocities of these observers? Well, the middle observer would say that they are the same, just in opposite direction. The observer A would say that he is at rest and the observer B is moving with a twice the velocity away from him. But the observer B would argue that he is at rest and the observer A is moving away from him. But who is right? There is no physical experiment any of these observers could do to detect their own motion. So unless you specify the reference frame in which you want to know their velocities, this question is meaningless. The same goes with special relativity and time unless you specify a reference frame in which you want to read their clocks, this question is also meaningless. This is what relative quantity actually is. But not everything is relative. If you took the magnitude of a difference between these two velocities, you would get the same answer in all frames of reference. So in Galilean relativity, despite the fact that velocity is a relative quantity, you can make an absolute quantity out of it. And this makes sense because principle of relativity teaches us one thing, that result of an experiment should not depend on the reference frame you choose. So, for example, imagine two balls moving towards each other, so they crash. The result of this collision should not depend on who is locking, right? But the result of this collision would depend on how fast these balls are approaching each other, even though different observers would measure different velocities for the respective balls. In special relativity, if you want to compare clocks, you have to do it at one particular position, 
so that two observers can shake their hands and compare their wrinkles. All observers should agree on who is younger when two observers are at the same location. And this applies to everything. Whenever an observer has a certain age at some convenient position, like near a particular star, this has to be true for everyone. Because if he crashed into the star and died at a certain age, it would be really weird if he didn't agree on what was his age when he died. But in special relativity, a scenario where two observers can meet at a certain location twice is kinda tricky, because this requires so that at least one observer accelerates, and therefore he changes his frame of reference. But this is twin paradox, and I have a dedicated video about it. I would like to thank people who supported my work in any way, whether it's through Patreon, Coffees, or Super Thanks. This is an extremely valuable help, since to be honest, being a PhD student in Czech Republic ain't so easy. So each of these contribution has a huge impact on me. So I thank you again. And if you want to apply this new knowledge right away, I recommend you this Twin Paradox video. I see you there.